the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story from March 2009. I'm Kristen Jenkins. Hi, I'm Sanka Johnson. I'm a professor at Duke University, and I study vision and evolution and color, uh, mostly in the ocean. So what happens when light enters water? Water does a number of things to light. It's like one big filter. I mean, you can think of it like as just like you know, a big piece of colored glass, except it takes deeper to do you know, this job of filtering. So if you're in the ocean, the light comes in, and mostly what happens is that water likes to absorb red light and it likes to absorb really blue, purple light, green light a little bit less. And so what comes through is light that's bluish, a little bit greenish, and that goes down much, much farther than anything else. Um, one of the things I do with my job is we go down in submersibles, which is really fun, and you can watch it as you go down. You start up near the surface and look up, and the sky still looks like the sky, it's sort of a blue sky, very, very bright, and you know, the sun still looks white. And as we move down, things get bluer and bluer and bluer until the, you know, the most blue you can imagine. Imagine like a laser of blue color, and just goes down and down like that, and eventually you know, it becomes dark. But before that, you know, it's just this extraordinary clear blue from this filter. Um, and this is almost entirely due to the light being absorbed by the water. The little photons come in, they hit a water molecule, and a good number of them are just sort of sucked up and turned into heat. Um, and you're left with the blue ones. Um, if you're in coastal water, or if you're in lakes, um, like where these fish are, um, a lot of other things happen too. The water itself is still letting blue light through without anything else, but you also have other things in the water like chlorophyll, lots of little algae. You have dirt, essentially stirred up from the bottom. You have all kinds of dissolved organic matter, which has this funny German name of Gelbstoff, which means yellow stuff. And um, you have what's called scattering. So in addition to the light being absorbed, it hits all these little particles of tiny little algae, of dirt, this and that, and bounces all over the place, which also changes what can get through. And so in the end, you end up with water that can be green all the way actually to being reddish. Um, mostly around here, if you go to coastal waters, you'll see that they're pretty green, maybe with a slightly yellow tinge. But if you go into lakes, they can actually be quite red. Um, if you notice this in any of the lakes around North Carolina, you look into them, they almost have a funny orange color to them. So what this means for the animals that live in there is that it's not like being on land. For us, on land, when we look at something, we get a pretty good idea of what the color is. And it doesn't matter much where we are. If we climb a tree, things look about the same than when we're at the bottom of the tree. But if you're a fish or any other kind of animal in the water, um, sometimes moving just a few inches down in the water completely changes the way the world looks. One, the world may get a lot, lot darker. So if you're in a murky lake, dropping a few inches can be like going from blazing sunlight to sitting in a dark room um, in the late evening. And going you know, a few more feet down, it can be pitch black. Um, I've gone scuba diving in water where you could see nothing. You were only five, six feet underwater, jet black, and with a flashlight, you couldn't even see the tip of your nose. It was so murky and, well, essentially disgusting. Um, in the ocean, this happens, it happens more slowly because the water is a lot clearer, but still, you know, when you're at the surface and going down, you know, things change. Things get darker, but the colors change as well. And so, let's say you, you know, want to show off your nice red coat or, you know, your pretty red lipstick or something of that sort. Um, if you go down, even in the ocean, five to ten feet, that color is gone. All that's left is black. Um, it's actually a really strange thing when we go scuba diving, we go down and you look at everybody's lips and they're black. They're actually sort of a black green and if you're unlucky and a fish bites you and you bleed, the blood comes out completely black um, because all the red light is gone and so anything that's red looks black. Um, if you're in coastal waters or in a lake, this can also happen to all the blue colors. It can even happen to all, you know, the green colors and all that's left 
is things might look, you know, a little bit reddish or they might look a little sort of a murky, brownish, yellow, and that's, you know, all you have left. And so animals that want to live at different depths have to be sensitive to different colors and they have to think about this, um, particularly because a lot of animals, um, you know, for us it's easy. Um, very easy for us to recognize another human. We're not going to accidentally mate with another animal because um, nobody looks like us. Um, but with fish, a fish could be surrounded by fish of a hundred different species that they cannot mate with and that may actually fight them if they get close to them and have a difficult time sorting them from each other. So the way that they do this, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, if you go to the coral reef and you see all these beautiful colors, these insane stripes, patterns, the whole thing, and that, you know, the young ones look completely different from the old ones, the reason for that is that that's how they can identify each other by species and also identify each other by gender. Um, so that when a fish goes up to another fish, they know that they are at least looking at an adult of the opposite sex of the same species who, you know, they might actually like to mate with. Otherwise, they could show up and find somebody of the opposite species who would more rather eat them or find somebody of the same sex who might want to fight them um, or find somebody who's not an adult who has no interest at all. Um, and sometimes this isn't a big deal. You walk up and they're like, well, you know, I don't want to mate. No big deal. Um, but a lot of cases, like with the blue crabs we work on here, um, you walk up and it's an animal that isn't interested in mating with you, and it chops off your arm. Immediately reaches out the clock, takes it off, and that's what happens you know, in our tanks fairly often. Um, so you need a way of sorting things out. And they do this in a lot of cases by color. Um, but like I said, this works really well near the surface where you can see all the different colors, but deeper down it might not. And so what you end up finding is that the animals that live deeper have different colors and different color vision than the animals that live up near the surface. And so they can end up being sort of isolated from each other. Um, the ones that are deeper, and let's say you're in the ocean, and so deeper means that things are bluer versus shallower, meaning things could be all sorts of different colors. You'd find that the deep animals, and we do find this, are better at seeing blue light and if they are sending signals to each other, meaning that they have colorful patches on their body saying, you know, I'm the opposite sex, I'm your same species, they'll tend to be blues or maybe greens because some of the green still gets through. In the shallower water, you might find animals using a whole different rainbow of colors. They might be using the reds, the yellows, um, even the purples. And you'll find animals that can see all those different colors. And this is a way, even if animals are only separated, like I said, in some of these lakes and so on, by a few inches of depth, or maybe just a few feet of depth, to almost be like they're living in two different worlds. Um, however, there's sort of an ecological consequence of this, which is that what happens when we start disturbing water? What happens when water becomes murky because of things that humans did? One of the classic things that happens is we farm. We farm with fertilizer. The fertilizer runs off the fields, not all of it actually gets into the ground, gets into the rivers, and then from the rivers ends up in the oceans or ends up in these big lakes. All that fertilizer gets in there and it ramps up the amount of nutrition. And the things that live off the nutrition are lots and lots of little single-celled algae and lots and lots of bacteria and they go crazy. They've never seen that much food in their life. They grow, they grow, they grow, they mate, they mate, they mate. You end up with what's called a bloom and the water will actually go from looking fairly normal to pea soup. You can't, you know, even look into it. If you stuck your finger into it an inch, you wouldn't be able to see the tip of your finger. And then this eats, sucks up all the oxygen and they can all die. So this is, you know, considered a bad thing. However, it often can happen not as extremely and the water just becomes a little bit murkier or it becomes a little bit greener. But this can still have a real problem because then animals that have adapted to see certain colors and have certain colors on their body so that they can, you know, separate each other out can no longer do this. And one interesting study several years back looked at the cichlids in Africa. There are these amazing populations of these fish. Uh, they're aquarium fish. You can get them in a lot of stores around here. Beautifully colored, lots of different varieties. And some of these lakes will hold 50 to 100 different species. 
Um, and they are isolated from each other, we call it reproductive isolation, by the colors of their body. And what's happened over the years, there's been farming around these lakes, other things, these lakes have become murkier, they've become greener, they've become darker, and so the animals are no longer able to see that certain fish look different. And so they end up going up to other fish that aren't really their species, and sometimes they just can't mate at all, but many times they will mate, and they'll hybridize. And when this happens, it's essentially like creating a whole bunch of mutts. You start out with all these different breeds of dogs, you allow them to all interbreed, and pretty soon all the dogs look more or less the same. You have all these different mutts. And this is what's happened in these lakes. You've started out with this amazing diversity, the water's gotten murkier, and the diversity has shrunk. And so you can see that human effects, um, while sometimes not as dramatic as, you know, killing off everything with a big die-off of a bacteria bloom or an algae bloom, can still take away all this, you know, really wonderful biodiversity we have by making it harder for animals to see and identify each other. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution.